Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who's joining us today. Welcome to this webinar on improving data systems for sanitation. My name is Batsirai Majuru, and I will be moderating today's webinar. This webinar is hosted by IWA in collaboration with ESAWAS, Eastern Southern African Water and Sanitation Regulators Association, and the World Health Organization. Just some disclaimers before we get into today's webinar. The webinar will be recorded and made available on demand on the IWA Connect Plus platform. The speakers are responsible for securing copyright permissions for any work that they'll be presenting today. And any of the opinions, hypotheses, conclusions, or recommendations that are contained in today's presentations are the sole responsibility of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect IWA opinion. Okay, I see we have about 89, oh yeah, more participants joining us today, 91 now. So a warm welcome again to everybody. Just to make sure that today's session runs smoothly, a bit of housekeeping. Please use the chat box that is at the bottom of your screen to introduce yourself, tell us who you are, uh, which organization you represent, where you're joining us from, or if you have any general comments or other interactive activities. Use the Q&A box specifically to send questions to the panelists. So if you need a question to, to be answered, please use the Q&A box. Do not use it, do not put it in the chat. Okay, just to highlight the context in which this webinar is being held. This is a follow-up to a previous webinar that was held in June on safely managed sanitation, which was in, in introducing WHO's new learning package on this topic. Some of the key messages from this webinar highlighted that widespread institutional strengthening in the areas of governance, finance, data, capacity, and innovation is needed to support the transition to safely managed sanitation. It also highlighted that acceleration in sanitation needs to be delivered through professionally managed services and regulated services rather than through, via, rather than through household and market-based interventions alone. So today's webinar is picking up on the data aspect. Um, for a bit more context as well, um, this is linked to IWE's work, sorry, um, next slide, please, on inclusive urban sanitation. And this work seeks to reshape the global urban sanitation agenda by focusing on inclusive sanitation service goals and the service systems that are required to achieve them. This is going by beyond infrastructure and technology. It also seeks to engage the public, private, and ac academic sectors to share their experiences and define global goals and fundamentals of a public sector approach to service outcomes. And the initiative is being progressed through um, the Sunny Action Campaign, which is IWA's global call to action on inclusive urban sanitation. There's an advisory board and a task force that has been formed in this regard. Um, this is also linked to the IWA Inclusive Urban Sanitation Champions Program, which recognizes excellence, leadership, and innovation in the sanitation sector. This is open to individuals, teams, and champions, and there are various categories for this program. The winners will be announced at a ceremony during the IWA Development Congress that will be held in December in Kigali, Rwanda. Okay, so coming to today's session, we have three speakers um, who are shown on the screen. Again, my name is Batsirai Majuri, and I'm the one who's moderating this session. I work at the World Health Organization headquarters in Switzerland. Our speakers today are from um, the Eastern Southern African Water and Sanitation Regulators Association, SOS, that being Yvonne Magawa, um, followed by um, Cholan Dilima, who's with the National Water and Sanitation Council, the regulatory authority in Zambia, as well as Francesco Mittis, who's with the WHO side of the Joint Monitoring Program on Water Supply, Sanitation and Hygiene. Keep introducing yourselves in the chat. I see we have 127 participants that are connected. That's great to see. Just a quick overview of today's agenda. We'll have uh, three presentations from the speakers that I've just introduced, each 10 minutes. After each presentation, we'll have 15 minutes of interaction. Well, we'll have an ideation activity of about five minutes just to jog your brains and 10 minutes to allow for um, any questions from your side. And then we'll have um, an overview of our key messages. So with that, um, let's get started. And I will introduce um, today's first speaker. Cholan Bilima has over 17 years of experience in water supply and sanitation regulation, working with NUASCO um, at senior management level. She specialized in governance, sector reforms, economic and incentive regulation, um, water operators partnerships, skills development, and many other activities. 
She has a master's degree in business administration with a bachelor's in development economics and a postgraduate in integrated water resources management. She also has professional qualifications in areas of corporate governance, utility management, and organizational development. With that, um, Chola, over to you for the, today's first presentation on demonstrating national level efforts to close sanitation data gaps in Zambia. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the introduction and um, a very warm welcome to our uh, participants. Um, I've already been introduced, so I will go straight into the subject matter. Um, I'll be focusing on the issue of demonstrating national level efforts to close the sanitation data gaps, um, a case of Zambia. Now, before I even delve into the presentation, I'm sure you all know that data is a deal breaker. The lack of data is actually a deal breaker for most of, of um, the work that we do, either as uh, service providers or as regulators. So we cannot emphasize, um, uh, overemphasize the need for data. Now, um, in Zambia, we realizing that we really need the data to actually uh, be able to regulate and also to be able to uh, provide services uh, for, for sanitation in particular. We have tried to um, you know, demonstrate how this data can be utilized. And um, in doing so, we've tried to really uh, showcase some of the information that we've been able to collect. Of course, um, this is still work in progress, but just to, to reflect how this data can be um, you know, reflected and how it can be utilized by different stakeholders, we've tried to incorporate some pieces of information that we've been able to collect uh, in our benchmarking report. And some of the information um, includes you know, the issues of population that is accessing sanitation by various means, either sewer connections, septic tanks, or pit latrines. And um, we've also tried to now emulate the ladders, the GMP ladders in trying to reflect the same information. So basically what we are saying there is that um, we need standards for sanitation facilities. If we are able, if, if we are going to be able to, uh, you know, gather this data and package it in a manner that will help to, make, to inform decision making, we need to have standards for sanitation facilities. Then we also need to have um, standard data collection tools. So what sort of tools are we using to collect the data? And across the country, across all the stakeholders that are working in that space, we need to agree on standard tools so that when we are collecting this data and packaging it, we know it's data that is uh, comparable. We know when we say septic tank, we mean septic tank. And when we say pit latrine, we mean pit latrine so that um, people can make decisions based on that uh, particular data. Then of course, um, we also uh, need a system for data collection. So without a system, you cannot be able to collect the data because what, what basically happens is that um, when you don't have a system, you have various pieces of data sitting around everywhere and you won't have a consolidated picture of what is on the ground. So systems are very important. And in any case, we need to have these systems integrated to the national level. So if we have systems that start from the grassroots, from the service providers, they need to really um, culminate into the national level systems that should be able to inform policy and decision making. Now, talking of integrated systems, um, again, our case is that we are trying to see how we, could, we can um, develop a system that is integrated. So as a regulator, we do have um, a data capture system, which is uh, called the National, uh, the, the, the NUASCO Information System. And this is a very robust system that we use to capture data. But it's data that is at the level of uh, the, the, the regulator. So data comes from the service providers into the regulator. And this is uh, basically meant for the regulator to make regulatory decisions, and also inform some of the regulatory tools. Now, moving from there, 
we need to see how we then now aggregate this data and analyze it. And this is now the job of the regulator. The regulator needs to, to analyze the data and be able to visualize it in different forms. So like the charts that I showed there, there were charts basically reflecting the same information, but in different forms. So one was showing the access levels um, based on the various forms of sanitation. The other one reflected the same data, but using the GMP ladders. So we aggregate the information, we analyze it and provide it at a national level where you know um, other aspects can also be incorporated as you look at the data. So you could integrate things like climate change, health, in trying to analyze the data and make sense out of it. And then from there, you package the information and uh, report it to the various stakeholders. So that basically means that you transform the data into information that focus on critical KPIs. So for our decision makers, you need to really pick out the critical uh, aspects that need to be brought out for them to make the decisions and package them in a manner that will be easy to understand and very quick uh, you know, to absorb by the different stakeholders. And basically, when we are dealing with data, we need to make sure that um, it's responding to the needs of the different stakeholders. So the packaging has to follow the needs of the stakeholders. Depending on which stakeholder you want to interact with, you need to package the data in such a way. And then it's always important to have the end in mind. What is it that you're trying to achieve with this data? And that will inform how you package it, how you disseminate it, and who you target your dissemination to. So there, I think really the takeaway is that uh, data must move from sub-national to national levels for it to be able to be utilized for decision-making processes. Now, coming to the issue of um, using this data, you know, we need to move from data to information for decision-making. Now, most of the countries, most of the institutions have lots of data that they collect and it's sitting in their systems or in their reports, but you will find that there's, there's uh, usually a gap between data and information. So this is where now um, as regulators and also other stakeholders, we need to see how we move from data into information for decision-making. And there, what I'm showing you are just um, two maps that are basically trying to reflect what, what we could do to package uh, the data into information for decision-making. So the first map there uh, um, on your left, is looking at sanitation distribution in one uh, city in, in, in Zambia called Chipata. And basically with that data, what you see is that uh, we're trying to reflect the sanitation ladders, okay? So those graphs that I showed earlier, if you want to now package easy to understand and for decision-making, you could actually take that very information and package it into a map like this one where you are basically just showing color coding and immediately somebody is able to see where the need lies. So for example, where you see the blues um, is uh, you know, where you find that these are households that are lacking uh, sanitation. So it's easy for you to target interventions and design you know, uh, you know, strategies to deal with the issue. Then on the other side, you also get a map that is showing you, you know, basically information on toilets. And again, when you package it like that, literally it's showing you where you have your toilets and where you don't have your toilets. So the brown color there shows you that you have very few toilets in those areas. And again, this is a map that is, uh, is for the same chipata, but packaged in a different way for people that would want to intervene to actually construct the toilets themselves. Whereas the other one is trying to look at the ladders, you know, people may have the toilets, but are these safely managed? So again, this is different ways of uh, packaging the information for different stakeholders. So there are the key messages that you need different information package for different uh, stakeholders. You also need to map your facilities. So if you don't have a visual picture of your facilities, it will be very difficult for you to actually package the information. Because you know, when you are discussing sanitation, 
it doesn't help to just put the information, the data in text. It will be very hard for anyone to pick the information and understand. And then of course you need the key message. So below each of these maps, you could say, you know, the, you, the majority of the population do not have toilets and very easily somebody will be able to pick it from the brown colors, they will be able to see. On the other side, you could say, you know, the majority of our population do not have safely managed uh, facilities. And again, with the map and just one key message, one or two key messages, somebody will be able to pick what you're trying to say. And, you know, from there, you can actually influence decision making. So what I'm trying to say here is that simplicity is the ultimate uh, sophistication. Uh, that's a quote that I'm picking from Leonardo. We need to keep it simple. If we want to move data to information for decision making, we need to keep it simple and not the graphs that I showed earlier. Those graphs that I showed earlier are too technical and maybe they are useful for us who are working at the technical level. But when you move up the ladder at national level and when you want to target policymakers, the politicians, you will need to have different methods of packaging the data and also be able to make it as simple as possible for them to understand. Thank you very much. So I thought I could share that and um, um, I'll be able to receive any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Chola, for that presentation and really for highlighting that need to package data in a meaningful way that transfers or transmits useful information. Um, if you have questions for Chola, please type them in the Q&A box that is at the bottom of your screen. I see there's already a question that is there, Chola, so you can have a look at it. Um, and in the meantime, we have a little activity just to jog people's brains a bit. So the map on the screen right now is part of the ideation activity that I'm just going to share with you. And the question is, the World Health Organization is concerned with the sanitation-related disease outbreak in three areas of City A. They need expert advice on the most vulnerable areas for intervention. What data would you need to collect to guide your decision? And where would you advise them to prioritize effort? The green dots indicate safely managed facilities. And um, just as a recap, safely managed means um, Safely managed facilities are those improved sanitation facilities that are not shared with other households and where excreta are safely disposed of in situ on site or transported and treated off site. So we'll give you a few minutes to just think about what data would be needed in order to address this intervention. This is an open-ended question, so there's no ideal answer. We're really trying to gauge your thoughts on what would be useful. I'll allow a minute for that. Okay, thank you everyone. So again, um, if you have questions for Chola, they'll go in the Q&A. And if you have any responses to this question, they'll go in the chat. I see some that are coming through now. Um, increased coverage of improved sanitation in the areas that are lacking. Um, I think the question was more, what kind of data would you like to see rather than the intervention? Let me see if there are other responses that have come through. Um, safe sanitation coverage, personal hygiene facilities, water accessibility, etc. So like I said, there is no um, uh, one size fits all answer. So it's a number of variables or a number of data pieces that would need the number of consumers or the size of the population, the type of facilities and service type. Um, is it sewered or non-sewered, uh, sources of water, uh, containment facilities, um, emptying methods for um, um, on-site systems or location of treatment plants, et cetera, et cetera. But thank you to everyone who participated in this question. Now with that, we'll turn to the questions for Chola. Um, Chola, one of the questions that was in the chat is, is there a one-stop platform for accessing, storing, analyzing, and visualizing sanitation data from various sources and levels? Um, thank you very much for that question. And I think I did try to, to type some response to that, but I will still just go back to the same uh, question. So as far as I know, you know, data needs vary from institution to institution. So like you indicated in your ideation activity, 
there is no one size fits all. And as far as I'm aware, there's no off the shelf, um, you know, system that can provide or answer to all your needs. So the best way to go about it is actually to, to develop um, your own system that will respond to your data requirements and also your context because context also differ. So um, what uh, you know, institutions need to do is to engage in a process where you understand the data needs, first your own, but also for other stakeholders, and then begin to uh, build a system that will respond to those data needs, the, the data needs of the stakeholders and the data needs of the institution that is involved. Mm -hmm. So basically, I think that's, that's what I would say on that uh, question. Thank you for that. And I see there's another one here uh, from Andy Narcott. Sourcing data from different stakeholders involves, uh, from the different stakeholders involved along the sanitation chain requires considerable buy-in and alignment between actors. How did Nwasco get buy-in and support from the various ministries, agencies, and service provider associations who collect data and flag the data gaps required for public health or performance monitoring? That's a very good question. And I think that is one of the very key challenges that we need to be aware of. So in sanitation, basically what you find is that there are various stakeholders that each play a, a, a different role. And for you to get to consensus on issues of data is really not an easy thing. So what you need is constant engagement with the stakeholders and you need to begin by clarifying the roles and responsibilities, who's doing what, so that you also, in doing that, you are also going to be streamlining the sort of data that is required for each of those stakeholders. Um, so the, the, the process there really requires very, very intense engagements with the stakeholders to make sure that you understand, first of all, the data that is required, the definitions of the different aspects that you are collecting, and also to accept that one of the stakeholders should be responsible for the role of collecting data. So in our case, we did get through this very laborious engagement with stakeholders. And at the end of it, we agreed that NUASCO should be the custodian of the data and should actually be the one in the forefront in collecting uh, this information. So that's what I would, I would answer for that one. Thank you for that, Chola. And yeah, um, I think what you just highlighted uh, is very key. Having a custodian for the data um, is absolutely important. I see there are many more questions that are coming up in the chat. Um, and I think we'll probably need to move on. But if we have one more question, a uh, time for one more question. Um, the question from Muhammad al is policymakers can be planners, legislators, or financial planners. How can you unify the form of data presentations to all? So the answer to that question is that uh, is what I mentioned uh, towards the end of my presentation, that you need to understand uh, what each uh, stakeholder is looking at. So like you are saying, policymakers can be planners, they can be legislators, they can be financial planners. And with that, already it gives us indication that they will require different forms of data. So the data that a legislator would need is not the same data that um, you know a financial planner would need. Or if at all they need the same data, the context of that data would vary. So for example, um, if you are looking at a legislator, the same data that I was showing, those maps that I was showing there, for a legislator, when you look at issues of safely managed and you look at the numbers of uh, facilities that are not safely managed, you may wish to send a message there that probably our legislation is not strong enough on the facilities that are being constructed and therefore the legislator needs to deal with issues of legislation to be able to make enforcement easy. Whereas, um, you know, for a planner, you could actually combine that information with other relevant information like maybe, uh, uh, disease outbreaks and things like that, and be able to send a message that speaks to the planner. For the financial person, you would also package the same information to talk about the investment requirements, perhaps that would you know be drawn from that piece of information. So I think 
the message that I sent out in my last slide was that we need to have the end in mind. What are we trying to achieve? So if I'm trying to influence investments, a financial person, I will package that information to speak to what those people stand for so that they are able to make decisions in that regard. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for that, Chola. I think with that, um, I'll say thank you. And if you could look at the other questions that have been addressed to you in the Q&A box, please keep the questions coming. We will have time for more questions towards the end of the webinar. But for now, let's move on to our next speaker, who is Yvonne Magawa, who is the Executive Secretary of SOS, the Eastern Southern African Association of Water and Sanitation Regulators. She oversees the support to African water and sanitation regulators to improve urban sanitation services by integrating non sewer sanitation in regulation. Yvonne has over 18 years of experience in uh, water and sanitation regulation and holds an MBA um, and her responsibilities have been mostly, uh, mainly focused on formulating and implementing corporate strategy, risk management and corporate branding. Her background in the water sector includes working in development corporation and the Zambian National Water and Sanitation Regulator. And she has been instrumental in supporting the growth of SOS since its inception and has published several papers on water and sanitation regulation in the region. With that, um, over to you, Yvonne, to talk about regional approaches to strengthen sanitation data system. Thank you very much, Patsy. And also thanks to Chola for um, the introduction. So as mentioned, I am focusing on the regional approaches on how to what we are doing as the Eastern and Southern Africa Water Supply and Sanitation Regulators Association, which is um, an association of 12 countries. To recap, why regulators look at issues of data, we know that regulation is data intensive. Without the correct data, you get the regulation wrong because you are depending on um, the data regarding the quality of service in order to make decisions about how the sector should move. In most cases, the data is guessed. We are not getting the real situation on the ground. The, the service providers sometimes make up the numbers. Even ourselves at country level, at the national level, we make up the numbers. And there is a common adage that says, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. But we are collecting a lot of information that is supposed to help us to track um, progress, including for SDG 6.2. But the questions that we need to be asking ourselves is, who has the responsibility for data collection? And do we know what we have achieved? Do we have the baseline of where we're coming from? And do we have the targets to guide where we're going? And how do we then plan the interventions? As a regulator, the regulator has a core mandate, which is to advise on the status of the sector. This is in fact enshrined in most um, uh, legal instruments of the regulators as a function, as a mandate of regulation to be able to advise on the status of the sector. To do this, the regulator monitors and reports on the performance of the sector. Uh, a landscape study which was done by SAWAS revealed that in 56% of uh, countries across Africa, which is 54 countries that were done, reports are produced on service provider performance by these uh, regulatory entities. And within that report, benchmarking is a key feature of these impressive reports. So a number of uh, KPIs are tracked. Uh, we have only highlighted uh, the 10 key uh, uh, performance indicators. And if you look at the percentages, you find that most countries do try to track um, the progress on coverage. But in terms of other indicators, these are left behind. When we look at what we call sanitation coverage, it is actually sewerage coverage. And in, um, in a number of cases, the non sewage side is completely left out. We, we have tried to put the water supply and sanitation data in the form of a pyramid. Where is the lowest level of collecting this data? This is at the consumer level. And the consumer is concerned with service quality and price. As we build up, we realize that there are different purposes for the data, different interests at the different levels of why data is needed. The same piece of information that relates to coverage in terms of the profile of a consumer, for example, and what type of water point they have, 
will be treated differently at a different level. For the utility, they are concerned with how are they providing the service. So they want to information on their operations. They're using that piece of information to be able to plan for where they need to put um, services, how they are handling, uh, how the, the commercial side is performing, the technical side is performing and so on. Whereas at the municipality level, they are more interested in seeing who is covered and who still needs to be catered for within planning and which new areas um, need to be uh, opened up. Whereas the regulator is more concerned with compliance, how are the service providers actually performing according to the conditions that have been set for the sector. So they look at service quality. They look at what sort of issues consumers are complaining about. They look at the performance um, of the, the service providers in terms of the tariff and various other aspects of, of compliance. At the national level, it's sector oversight. How are we going to ensure that the sector is catered for? Uh, within the national plans. So investment planning, the policy, how is the, uh, are we doing against the performance of policy? At the region and, and global level, which is uh, the, the JMP level, for example, we're looking at monitoring and tracking the progress of the sector so that we are able to put together certain goals. So if you look at this pyramid, as you go upwards, the aggregation um, of the numbers becomes larger and larger, which means if we are wrong right at the lowest level, we are wrong throughout and the margin of error becomes bigger. So we need to be able to assess performance very well. We need to be able to guide the sector very well. And that is why closing the data gaps, even for sanitation becomes very critical. As a regional regulators association, we are investing in closing this data gap through the regulatory systems, as well as national information systems. We have developed a data strategy as a SAWAS, which is uh, trying to address issues of investing in data infrastructure, as well as capacity building and a number of other interventions. But as a SAWAS, we are trying to uh, develop what we're calling a maturity index that allows us to gauge where countries are in terms of the, the data framework that they have. Um, for the sector. And therefore, we will be able to identify where to intervene. So this is uh, combining IMS and GIS for data collection and also um, having uh, the correct uh, capacities to be able to manage this data. We need to be able to identify system purpose, which is something that we're trying to assist countries to do. Why do you need the system? Who should be uh, uh, part of that system in terms of the data collection? Who are the users of the system? So you need to be able to define the system users. You need to be able to know the custodian of system. As the example was given in Zambia, a decision was made for the regulator to be the, the custodian of the system. But within other countries, it may not be the case. So the custodian of the national level system is critical in order to know how the other um, actors feed in. We need to be able to define the data collection responsibilities. Who is supposed to actually collect the data and feed it into the system? Is it the service providers? Is there data collection at the consumer level? Is there data collection from other sector actors like UNICEF, um, World Bank, and so on, who also have various uh, projects in the sector? Who then verifies this data at the end of the day? So we want to strengthen data verification through more robust systems, through digitizing um, certain elements that will be able to do that cross-referencing um, for, for the plausibility of data. Then we need to understand reporting requirements. What sort of data needs to be reported? How do you present the data? How do you package um, data for the different levels, for policy level? for informing on the performance of the sector and so on. At the end of the day, all this is grounded in building the right capacity. Capacity in terms of systems, capacity in terms of the human resource, capacity to be able to collect, to use and give value to data. So as a source, um, some of the tools that we are also developing to assist in collecting data, to close the gap right from the local level, we are in the process of finalizing the development of a tool called Sanitracker, 
which is going to assist um, the private operators to be able to collect data about the service um, on the ground. So it is what we're calling the Uber of sanitation, yeah? For private sector to be able, for consumers to be able to request for services and private sector will be able to provide those services using digital uh, methods. And also where they empty at the dumping site, they also have um, ability to be able to accept jobs for dumping and all this will be fed into one system. So at a region level, we'll have an interface that allows us to see what is happening in the different countries in terms of the status of sanitation, the, the people that are being serviced and so on. The country level will have information about the country, the areas, the utilities, right down to the lowest level where the, the service provider itself can have information about their business, how they're doing, and the utility can have oversight of all this information. The other tool that has been developed as uh, in conjunction with um, support from uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and Athena Economics is called Equiserve. It's available online and this is um, for informing different decisions for intervention um, in series. So it tries to do scenario analysis on the impact on equity, safety, and sustainability of a certain investment into the sector. So it allows you to see how many people you'll be able to cover, um, what the cost is, what type of hardware decisions you'll be able to make to be able to have um, a correct basis for, for making these decisions. So this is scenario analysis, somehow uh, predictive uh, in order to guide where to best uh, make uh, an investment for the sector. So using this kind of tools also um, exposes where data is missing in order for you to make a very good decision. So this is the, the kind of work that we're doing at the SAWAS level. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Yvonne, for that presentation and very interesting to see what is happening at the regional level, working together with the various member countries of SOS. Um, I see there are some comments and also some questions that are in the chat. Again, a reminder, use the Q&A box specifically for questions that you'd like our panelists to answer and use the chat box for any experiences, any comments that you would like to share with everybody else here, just to make sure that our webinar runs smoothly. So while you're um, uh, sending out your questions to Yvonne, we have another activity for you that is popping up on the screen now. So Country B has decided to develop a national public data system to inform decisions about the sanitation sector. However, they are grappling with a few issues and need your help in three areas. The first is who should be the custodian of the national level system? So there are three options that are there and there's a single choice. Should it be the line ministry, the regulator, or a different government office? The second part to the question is, who should have the responsibility for data collection and entry? This is multiple choice. So you could take multiple entities, the line ministry, the regulator, utilities, private service providers, NGOs, or CSOs. And then the third question is, who should have access to the data or who should be the users? Again, this is a multiple choice and you can pick from the options that are selected there. I think there might be a couple of people who have not had the pop-up. I don't know if it's because the pop-ups are blocked, but we have some answers that have come through on the first one. So the majority have said uh, the custodian of the national level system should be the line ministry. And 34% have said it should be the regulator. And 9% have said it should be a different government office. Interesting. Um, can we move now to the second question? Who should have the responsibility for data collection and entry? The majority have said uh, the utilities, followed by the regulator. Oh, no, sorry, followed by the private service providers, 59%, followed by the regulator, 54%, then the line ministry, then NGOs, and then CSOs. And then on part three of that question, which was who should have access to the data, who should be the users. The regulator is leading 89%, and then the line ministry, then the utilities, then uh, development partners, interesting, at 77%, NGOs followed by CSOs. 
Um, is everybody able to see the results on the screen? Well, thank you everyone for your input. It looks like some people were not able to see it. I'm not sure why. Uh, it might have been a problem with pop-ups that were not appearing. But again, um, this was to really gauge your thoughts on some of these uh, questions that countries are grappling with now. So thank you very much for your input. So with that, we can turn now to the Q&A. And one of the questions I see, when you'd like to answer this question live. How does adopting digital methods of data collection bridge sanitation gaps in rural communities? Yeah, thanks, Patsy. Um, when we uh, change to digital methods of collecting data, we are trying to cut down the time of getting this information from the ground to a, a, a point where it can be information for decision making, as Cholo uh, put it in her presentation. So when we understand the actual situation on the ground, who has a service, who does not have a service, what type of facility do they have, and so on, we are better placed to then make a decision on what needs to change and whether we need to have new regulations being put in place because we have to understand the type of services that are in place in order to make decisions um, for the kind of regulations that need to exist. So it will help us to guide how the sector should then operate in terms of what sort of facilities are acceptable, what are the standards for these facilities, um, what, what sort of um, uh, uh, business model needs to be adopted in order to address um, the gaps. So this helps us um, to cut down the time that we need to get this data. Uh, at the moment, it's taking us a few good months to be able to get the data, translate it into information, produce the reports and so on. And now we are able to get data more in a few, a few hours, a day or two, you can get information. When you have the GIS mapping, you can get even more um, uh, visual information that allows you to actually even in, uh, uh, pick up areas that have health risks, which is very important because with these cholera outbreak, outbreaks that we mostly suffer, it is easy to see um, how the area is structured and you will be able to do some risk assessment and address them before anything goes wrong. Thank you. Thank you for that, Ivana. And yeah, um, very good point that you're highlighting that with um, disease outbreaks, you want to be able to respond in a timely manner and having that data being available to you in a matter of hours or days makes a big difference. I see also that there's a question that's here that you'd like to answer. Are there any tools to guide me um, operating a desludging tank with the shortest path from treatment plant to the household septic tank? Yes, so as I mentioned, under the Sunny Tracker, um, that is one of the features that the Sunny Tracker is, uh, has, where when a uh, a service provider or a private operator accepts a job to go and empty uh, at the consumer. It actually shows you the, the, the map or the distance to the consumer, and it shows you where the nearest dumping site is. So we are trying to make the sector also more efficient as much as we are trying to collect more accurate data from the ground it's also going to enhance the business um, of the private operators in terms of efficiency to serve and also efficiency to dump and we also have better records of how much waste is actually reaching the treatment plants how much is actually being safely safely treated and complete the whole chain of safely managed from uh, capture containment all the way to, to disposal or reuse. Mm. Thank, you. Thank you for that. And I see a question from Maya Wood and she says, how is the Senate tracker managed financially uh, as a service providers and regulators who need to pay for access? Um, Sunny Tracker is um, an initiative under open access. Um, so this means that it's very, very minimal cost only to manage um, the maintenance of the system. So you can reach out to us and we'll be able to, to discuss um, how that can be, can be done. Uh, we are still in the pilot phase. So within that phase, there is no cost to it. And we, we are happy to discuss if it's something that is um, suitable for your particular context. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, another question again from Arumagum PK. For future systems planned, uh, will this, does the existing system lend itself to accommodate further data? 
So yes. can we add additional system? Yes. And what we're trying to do at the SAWAS level is to actually reduce the requests that go to service providers, particularly utilities. They tend to have a lot of demand for certain data for different purposes. But what we're trying to do is to streamline and reduce those levels of data requests, but having systems that integrate and speak to each other, as opposed to developing systems on top of systems. So we are trying to create this single interface that then speaks to the different utility systems and draws data as needed, or the utilities can draw data that is needed from one interface to inform their own their own systems. So we are really trying to um, reduce levels of complexity when it comes to how that data is handled. Mm -hmm. um, there is another question here from Rahel Eber. And he said, how do you, how frequently do you produce reports from experiencing, from experience, starting is not a challenge. It's rather sustaining. What is your experience um, for the time that you've been doing this work on sanitation? And what is the change this has produced in raising the sanitation profile? So I guess it's a question of the impact that you have had um, from this monitoring system. Yeah, what I'll do is I will respond on behalf of the regulators, because at the SAWAS level, we simply compile um, what comes from the different regulators. In the last few years, um, we have the regulators moving from reporting just storage to reporting sanitation. And when we say sanitation, we're now talking of both sewer and non-sewer um, services. So the regulators are gradually incorporating different KPIs that give a more holistic picture on both uh, sewer and non-sewer. So we can also say sewer citywide inclusive sanitation. So with this, it means the reports of the regulators are beginning to change. As you saw from the example from Zambia, they are now including the JMP ladders, which cover all the different aspects of, of the ladder, uh, of, of the service, but also they are trying to show coverage in the different proportions, who is covered by sewer, who is covered by uh, septic tanks, really breaking down um, what sort of facilities you have. And this only comes from doing the baselines for sanitation to understand what is actually on the ground. And once those KPIs are adopted at the country level, at the region level, we have defined a certain framework. Uh, we have provided guidance in terms of the kind of KPIs that can exist across the whole sanitation chain and what sort of data is needed to be able to inform those KPIs. So the different countries are adopting um, in incremental uh, stages the, the KPIs which are applicable at a given stage. They cannot start with everything, but they are uh, taking on board what is manageable as they try to um, populate um, the data that is required to inform the different KPIs. Thank you, Yvonne, for that response. Um, so I think we might move on to the next speaker, but I see that there are a lot of questions that are coming up in the chat. There's a lot of interest in Sunny Tracker, but also maybe one if you could share the link to where people can find these regional in um, the regional framework and the KPIs that you mentioned, because I'm sure there'll be a lot of interest in that as well. So our next speaker is my colleague Francesco Mises, who is a statistician who graduated from the University of Rome, La Salipienza, um, and has been working for the World Health Organization since 1998 in several domains in Rome, Copenhagen and the headquarters office in Geneva. He's worked in the areas of epidemiological studies for people living near contaminated sites, health impact assessments for outdoor air pollution, exposure to waste and health, road traffic injuries, and violence and injury prevention. But since 2015, he's been working with, in the Water and Sanitation Hygiene Unit at WHO, first working with GLASS, the Global um, assessment, and, uh, assessment and Analysis of Sanitation and Drinking Water, and then now working as data manager for the JNP, where he has the responsibility of collecting data, developing and updating country files for the 235 countries and territories that the JNP monitors around the world, um, specifically for households and healthcare facilities. So Francesco will be speaking today on global efforts and monitoring sanitation for SDGs. Over to you, Francesco. 
Thank you, Batsy. Thanks to the organizer and thanks to everybody to be here. It's a pleasure for me trying to deliver in 10 minutes important messages. Uh, so there was one question, which are the at present gaps in uh, monitoring on-site sanitation. I will try to answer to this too during the presentation. Uh, but before starting, uh, let's have a quick look to definitions. It's important we are in the same boat. If you see on the bottom right part of the, of the slide, we have uh, our uh, letters containing uh, uh, five kind of definitions. Orange and light orange is open defecation and unimproved. I think it's familiar to everybody. And the upper three is what uh, used to be improved sanitation facilities during the MDG period. Now it's divided in three. Basically limited, the only difference is the sharing of the facility. So limited is improved and not shared. Basic is improved and shared. Safely managed is improved and something more. As Patsy said, there is the use of improved facilities that are not shared with other households and where excrete are safely disposed of in situ or removed and treated off site. That's very important because to calculate safely managed, we need some particular kind of data and we need to see to be on the same boat to do that. So um, what we do usually is considering three parameters, people using sewerage connection, people on septic tanks and people on improved latrines and composting toilet. If a country as a situation in which we have more people using sewerage than the other two, it's defined off-site dominant. To calculate safely managed, we need data on sewerage collection, but not only, we only need, we also need data on wastewater treatment at at least secondary level or a primary level with a long ocean outfall. In this case, we can calculate safely managed sanitation. If the country is on-site dominant, that means there is more population on septic and improved latrine and composted toilet than on sewerage, and this is usually the situation of uh, Africa, Latin America, South Asia, or least developed countries, we need data on containment, emptying practices, transport, and um, treatment of sludge to have a safely managed sanitation estimate. Otherwise, we can apply some default assumptions, something like 50% containment, or we cannot calculate anything. So said that, we try to calculate this at country, regional, and world level for the third time uh, after the SDG started with a report that has been published uh, in July uh, 2023. And the result was at world level, we have 57% of global population with safely managed sanitation, more in urban than in rural areas, but also that we have 3.5 billion people lacking safely managed sanitation. And of these 1.9 are with basic service, 560 million with limited, 545 with unimproved, and 40, 419 still practices open defecation. Uh, this is given by data for the safely managed sanitation services by data we got from 135 countries, area and territories out of the 235 that we monitor. Uh, for seven out of the eight SDG region, no estimate, you can see no dark green bar for Oceania, uh, but representing 80, 86% of the global population. Uh, huge uh, progresses are needed to achieve universal access to safely managed services by 2030, as the SDG requires. We will need a five-fold increase in current rates of progress for the world, 16-fold increase in least developed countries, and 15-fold in fragile context. So to go more in detail at country level, I just show a map that's on the report. Uh, you can see that's proportional population with safely managed sanitation services in 2022, uh, dark green means good, uh, orange means uh, low level, uh, gray, light gray means insufficient data. It means the cases in which we were not able to calculate it with few exceptions of Argentina, for instance, or Uruguay, for which we do not have data. Uh, all the other cases are low and middle income uh, country usually. It means that we do not have at national level uh, data representing uh, emptying and transport of. Um, what to do? The main gaps to get, not to get those light gray, it's to have data. Uh, 
uh, to have data, it means uh, it could mean what we are proposing, uh, having awesome service containing good questions. There were still household service containing good question on on-site sanitation, the MIX-6, for instance, for UNICEF, or the HS-8 from uh, the USA that starts to have something on uh, uh, on-site sanitation, uh, and, and a lot of national service containing questions a bit different from what we propose. What we propose now, now it's been adopted by MIX-7 service. We still do not have any of them finalized and completed, but they are doing it. And for the first time, there are questions on containment. So uh, you see these three questions. One is, uh, does your septic or improved pit latrine have an outlet pipe for liquid waste? Answer, yes, no. Second, where does this pipe go? To a leach field, soak pit, to a sewer, close drain, wastewater treatment plant, don't know where, open drain, water body surface, other, don't know. And the third, if in the last year, something happened to your sanitation facility, like overflowing, uh, containment collapsed, and things like this. Uh, by interpreting this three question, we can uh, have an answer whether there is containment or not to the sanitation facility that's been uh, during the interview with, we do to, to households, basically. Uh, if we do not have this kind of information, usually we... Um, we assume 50% containment for septic tanks and 100% containment for latrines. Uh, and then we have on the mix seven questions on emptying practices. These were already in the mix six, but it's not bad repeating what it was included. So the question is if a septic tanks or the improved latrine composting pilot has ever been emptied and is yes, emptied, no, never emptied, non attempted, but cover left undisturbed on full. The second one, who emptied that? If it was a service provider, if it was not a service provider, so if it was the family. And the third one, where the contents was going once emptied. So all of this means that not emptied is, means safely managed and emptied and something else safely managed. For instance, emptied and removed of site to treatment plant and emptied and buried on site. Uh, in a cover pit, but if it's empty or emptied uh, elsewhere, emptied to the water body, to open ground field or elsewhere, we don't know, it's uh, 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 unsafely managed. Anyway, having this few question in household service can help us to calculate the on-site sanitation uh, situation at country level in a nationally representative way for urban and rural area, and from which then we can calculate uh, the national one. Uh, of course, one survey is not enough. The survey should be repeated every four or five years or something like that. Uh, we are doing at WHO UNICEF with the JMP program also something different. We are not, not only the co-custodian agency for the SDG indicator on water and sanitation and hygiene, but uh, we are also working under the foundation of Bill and Melinda Gates for an on-site sanitation project. We have the six countries contacted during the, the first phase, Bangladesh, Ecuador, Indonesia, Kenya, Serbia, and Zambia. And uh, a couple of them already produced country reports that are uh, available on our uh, website that's listed here in the link. And uh, under the phase two, we have other countries, Malawi, Republic of Moldova, Oman, and uh, Nepal, in which we are starting, and all the material is available. The kind of indi core indicators we need, the household questionnaire that needs to be used, a sanitation inspection uh, form, for instance. Uh, the main results that we have, uh, and I have these slides with uh, uh, Bangladesh and Serbia, who deliver the final uh, survey, um, is um, mm, gives some common points, some common key messages. You can have the best em emptying practices, and these are two very different countries among themselves, but uh, if you don't have good containment, uh, your uh, safety and sanitation level will be uh, very low. And the same thing is happening in the two countries, Bangladesh and Serbia. Good emptying, emptying practices, but very bad uh, containment. Um, last two slides. Uh, there are a lot of indicators that can be used to monitor these kind of things. 
foreign site sanitation. We propose global indicators. There could be also national indicators. And you can see that they can be a bit different from our core questions, but if well conceived, they can be used for global monitoring and be compared with the results coming from the other countries. Of course, yeah, you have a long list for each of these. So you see the containment can be deal, dealt with the design standard, functionality of groundwater risk, for instance. But one thing I would like to, uh, to stress is uh, not to try to develop national indicators that do not match completely JMP or that says different thing. For instance, there are a lot of countries saying we have safely managed sanitation and in their uh, uh, monitoring system, basically. But what they mean for safely managed sanitation is having sewerage. Having sewerage doesn't mean having safely managed sanitation. But there are still a lot of reports around the world reporting this as safely managed. Um, last thing, we have talked about containment and emptying, but also we have transport and treatment. And in this uh, metrics, you can see the levels of reliability of several kind of data sources. Uh, for the kind of facility type, so if you have a, a latrine, a septic tank, composting toilet, or whatever, uh, the best tool is an household survey. For containment, household survey can be good, but an household sanitary inspection is much better. For emptying, household survey can be good, but you can also have data from service provider or from the local government. For transported treatment, household survey cannot do anything. The household cannot know after it's emptied where it's going and how it's treated. So it means that we need data from different data sources and different sectors working together to have uh, good results. Uh, that's over on my side. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Francesco, for that presentation. There are a lot of questions and comments for you um, in the Q&A box, but also in the comment box. So if you could start taking a look at that and indicate the ones that you're going to answer live. Um, so while Francesco is doing that, we have another exercise for you. And this is essentially to make sure that everybody has stayed awake during today's webinar. Um, so the, the exercise is coming up now. Okay, so we are back to our map. And in this exercise, Utility W has reported that in the first half of 2023, 217 facilities were emptied in area A with a sludge volume of 26,470 cubic meters and 100% safely treated. How can we verify this data? What would be the kind of input that we would need to verify this data? You can type your, your, your answers in the chat box. So this is an answer to how do we verify that uh, this said volume of 26,470 cubic meters of sludge was treated. And so some of the data pieces we would need according to the participants are um, where did the sludge go? who received it, um, a physical inspection, um, checking with plant operators, check the volume of, of sludge that they actually received at the plant, how many trucks, how many volumes, any data available from the utility and cross-verified at the treatment facility. Okay. Again, um, there's no complete answer. Um, the focus is on the techniques for monitoring and verification. And so some of the data that we could be looking for would be, um, again, like you said, data from the utilities, any records from the treatment plants on the volumes that they received. So you're very right in mentioning that. Inspection of PPE for workers, the type of equipment that has been used, records on volumes that have been emptied, assistance for tracking of facilities that have been emptied, uh, the GIS or other systems, and this is going back to Yvonne's earlier presentation, um, any effluent standards that have been met in the case that um, uh, the sludge has been treated and whether there was that, the records of compliance with the effluent standards. Okay. So thank you everyone for participating in that poll. We're now going to turn to questions um, for the last speaker. 
and we'll then also open it out for questions for uh, the other two speakers. So Francesco, there were some questions that had come up for you in the chat. Uh, I see that you marked some of them that you'll answer live. Uh, the first one is, are the sewage treatment plants designed to cater to the load for the quantity generated by the sewage connection? If so, where are the collections from, sep from septic tanks and latrines managed without causing environmental issues? This is a question from Ari Mudram PK. Francesco, over to you. Uh, yeah, uh, for this and for another question, I don't have the magical sticks, uh, I have to say. Uh, there is an ideal world in which the sewage treatment plan should be designed to gather to the load. So uh, they should uh, be able to uh, receive uh, the load of the sludge generated by the sewerage connection. So uh, everything should go uh, should go right if they were designed, but we cannot control it. So uh, and our monitoring arrived to understand if sewerage arrives there. We have some uh, some indication from the sector that can tell us how much is uh, reaching the treatment plan of the sludge. We are monitoring this parameter, for instance. Uh, for septic and pit latrines, uh, the same. Uh, if they are well emptied, and uh, if who's doing the serving, the service is doing a good survey. There shouldn't be there shouldn't be any problem. But we cannot know. If after they are emptied, the sludge arrived to the treatment plant, we have evidence of a lot of places where the truck uh, uh, just put a sludge in the rivers or just in the uh, overground, basically, but not where they should arrive. So the only thing to understand if they are not causing problem is uh, trying to monitor and to inspect the work that uh, all the operators are um, are doing and the same applies uh, Batsy to to the second question uh, on uh, biodigester toilets you can read the question if you want and I can go on answering to that okay um I think since you said it's similar uh maybe uh, I'll just quickly highlight that the question was in relation to um um unlike biodigester toilets that can be emptied and buried or covered at the site under hygienic conditions can septic tank latrines um, have the same? So I think you had already outlined a response. Uh, yes, the, the only thing to be to be added is that um, what we can monitor on that in our SMOS project, we do it. We have question on protective equipment, uh, on gloves or what the staff should wear, how to protect themselves while, while emptying and transporting the things. So that's something that can be monitored also uh, with our tools. Uh, uh, that we are applying, not with the household service. Uh, mm -hmm. In the household service, it's difficult to ask these kind of things. You ask if they are emptied but and who's emptying it, but you are not asking if uh, the provider or yourself are wearing grove, gloves or protective uh, equipment, basically. Thank you. Um, there's another question that says, how do you monitor equity and what tool should be employed? Oh. That's a good one. It depends what you mean for equity. If it's during the process uh, or at country level, uh, we monitor at country level, then regional and world level, uh, safely managed sanitation for urban areas and rural areas, and then uh, at national level. And we do it through, through the collection of uh, harmonized data sources, basically, as well service, but also data from provider. We put them all together in our country files. Um, we, through a regression, we calculate the estimates and we publish the results. That, as I said, they are at national, urban, and rural level. But we also develop something else to try to monitor uh, inequalities. We have uh, the so-called inequality files. So we extract from the data sources that we have more variable published in different kind of files and we are able to uh, describe which are the differences uh, in terms of uh, subnational sub regions for instance uh, whose number is different from country to country and also through well quintiles through a principal component analysis so these are different kind of analysis that we do not for all the countries. We have it 235 country files, but we have around 105, 110 inequality files because 
the kind of data that we need that should be of a certain of a certain kind it cannot be done for uh, for all the country i don't know if you meant that for monitoring equity that's what we do on our side uh, to monitor that and try to to show to to the countries how the situation can be different from region to region and from uh, the richest to the poorest Thank you, Francesco. I think I'll allow uh, one more question before we need to be um, wrapping up. And this question, I think, uh, is addressed to any of the panelists. And it says, one of the challenges is definition of the contained system on how the sanitation practitioners and communities un understand them. Definition and understanding of septic tanks still varies among communities. GMP definitions have been a great guidance on standardization of sanitation terminologies. How can we work together to have a unified, to have unified terminology and understanding? Uh, if I can start to say something on that, I can say whenever we receive data sources, sometimes we can have problems just because data are definition are not harmonized. There are a lot of countries defining cesspits or halting tank as a septic tanks in the Azul service. And to understand that, uh, you have to go to the countries or ask the countries what it means. Uh, it happened, for instance, in uh, Cambodia. For years, uh, they published the uh, pit latrine and septic tanks together. Now they're starting to work to distinguish them. Or in some Arabic countries, the holding tanks and cesspit are included inside the septic tank figure. So to understand this, it's difficult and you have to discuss with country. What we have done to try to harmonize the things uh, has been publishing core questions and indicators where all the definitions are very well specified. Uh, these are, uh, I can share the link in the chat if you want. These are on our web website, that's uh, washdata.org. And this is a document in all the UN languages specifying what we mean for sanitation facilities. And that's the document we recommend the countries to use when they develop puzzle service. Thank Over. you, Francesca. Um, Yvonne and Chola, if you want to come in on this question, how can we work together to have unified technology and understanding of what we mean of contained sanitation systems? Um, thanks, Patsy. From um, the regional level, um, what we're trying to do to enhance our understanding of common definitions and also working with um, WHO Regnet is we are trying to do more of uh, capacity development for um, the, the regulatory staff so that when we say coverage, we are all understanding the same thing. And we define um, um, coverage in the same way. So it is difficult when you look at an indicator in a, in, in, in a document and you don't see what is behind the indicator. So we are trying to unpack the indicators so that we're able to see, do we have the same understanding? We're also working with um, the World Bank IBNET team also to try and uh, get more guidance on how to standardize some of these terminologies. So developing this guidance at the region level helps us to then have similar understanding across the region. But we need to take this to a more global level. So may, working with WHO Regnet, working with um, the World Bank IBNET, uh, I think we'll be able to develop um, uh, more common definitions and understanding of some of these um, uh, aspects, especially the standards, like you're saying, issues of the septic tank. What is the septic tank? And how is it uh, defined in terms of the standards? Uh, if that understanding is the same, then it helps us to also speak the same language. So harmonizing these term term terminologies is very, very important. And Batsy will be talking about this, but we are delving more into those details uh, at the Iowa Development Congress in, in Kigali in December. So I invite you to join us uh, in a two-part workshop um, for that discussion. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, Chola, any thoughts from you on this? Yeah. Um... Uh, from us, I think what we are trying to do is um, we we are working with various partners. Uh, WHO is one of them. We have UNICEF and um, GIZ to try and develop standards. 
So what we realized was that, um, you know, standards were uh, not really speaking to each other. So you find that, for example, you, you want to, to have a standard for construction. So you get it maybe from the housing authorities, the local authorities that are in charge of regulating that would have their own defined standards. When you come to sanitation, you, you have your own defined standards. So we're trying to harmonize those standards at national level and come up with one standard that will speak to everything about you know construction, about uh, service provision, about the code of practice uh, for sanitation. And so we've, we've already moved quite ahead with that and come up with um, some final drafts that are under consideration, uh, having done uh, the public consultations on that. The other thing that we are doing is that we are developing an integrated information management system. Uh, so what we realized was that the regulator has an information system, but the information would end there. So we're trying to, um, you know, enhance accessibility of information. We're trying to make sure that we have a one-stop shop for all the data regarding sanitation. So we want to have a system that integrates from the utilities to the regulator, then to the national level. And at each level, the stakeholder will be able to have rights and, um, you know, permissions to work with the data that are, is relevant for their level. Um, and then for the ministry also, the data will be digested and presented in a manner that is relevant uh, at their level. But also other stakeholders like the, the cooperating partners, the NGOs, who also have you know, access to view the information and use it in their planning and also uh, other interventions that they would want to make. So basically that's what we're doing at national level. Thank you. Thank you, Chola. And I want to say a big thank you to um, our other speakers, uh, Francesco and Yvonne. This has been a very interactive and useful webinar. I see there are a lot more questions that are popping up in the Q&A. So maybe if the speakers could take a few of the three minutes remaining to just um, type responses there. And again, there's always opportunity for follow-up after the webinar. Um, people are asking again if they can have the presentation sent to them. I'll reiterate, the presentations will be made available on the IWA Connect Plus platform. So you can go there and access um, the recording of the webinar and the presentations and other materials that have been shared. Um, I'll also request my colleague Francesco to share the link to the GNP report. I see questions up coming up about equity and actually the latest GNP report had a thematic focus on equity. But with that, I want to say again, thank you to everyone who joined. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your comments and insights that you shared. I think a lot of the things that were highlighted in this webinar really underscored the need for understanding who is doing what as the real basis for then building um, data systems. Chola highlighted that one of the um, um, ways that we're able to get all sector partners together and share data was first understanding who is responsible for what and thereafter understanding what kind of data would be needed from them and what kind of data would be useful for them. So really starting with that um, ground up level in terms of building up data systems is, is important, but having a robust data system for informed decision-making is absolutely key for implementing any successful inclusive urban sanitation initiative. We also heard from Yvonne on the importance of having um, as custodians that are responsible for this data. So somebody has to be making sure that the data is appropriately packaged for the various stakeholders and the various levels of intervention that will be required. And so the custodian needs to be responsible for data management, analysis, and guiding policy interventions in the field of sanitation. And I think from the poll, we see that a lot of that was leaning towards um, the regulators that are working in this space. Um, from Francesco, we also heard um, how public data systems should prioritize addressing gaps in national monitoring and how this can link up with global monitoring efforts. So again, um, highlighting that there are big gaps in on-site sanitation systems and any work that, that, that is done to address those gaps either through improved household surveys or other approaches, such as the um, SMOS pilots that he highlighted in the countries that are being um, that are piloting those surveys would be important 
in addressing those data gaps. So with that, I want to say a big thank you to all our speakers. And I also just want to highlight a few of the activities that are coming up in the future. Um, there'll be another webinar that'll be coming up soon on sustainable estuarine and coastal development that's um, later on this month. And early in October, there will be a webinar on connecting young water professionals in Africa. I saw somebody asking in the comment how young professionals can be helped. So please look out for that webinar. Um, there's also the first IWA non sewer sanitation conference that is coming up that will be in Johannesburg on the 15th of October. Please use the link to register for that conference if you're interested in participating. There's also the IWA Digital Water Summit that will be taking place in Spain in November. Um, you can find out more about that on the IWA website and we showcase the latest in digital developments in the sector. And then there is the IWA Development Congress that is taking place in Kigali from 10 to 14 December. And specifically at this Congress, like Yvonne mentioned, there will be two sessions that will be held that will essentially be a follow-up to the discussion that we'll have today. These are workshops that will be delving into the nitty gritty of how do we monitor um, um, on-site sanitation and specifically safely manage on-site sanitation and what can we do to be strengthening data systems and much more um, accountability mechanisms towards that. So please, if you're going to be at the Congress, do join us for this session. And with that, I want to say thank you very much. Um, remember to join the network of water professionals. There is a discount that is applicable. You can go on the website that is displayed on the screens to find out more. Thank you. There's also the IWA Digital Water Summit that will be taking place in Spain in November. Um, you can find out more about that on the IWA website and we showcase the latest in digital developments in the sector. And then there is the IWA Development Congress that is taking place in Kigali from 10 to 14 December. And specifically at this Congress, like Yvonne mentioned, there will be two sessions that will be held that will essentially be a follow-up to the discussion that we'll have today. These are workshops that will be delving into the nitty gritty of how do we monitor um, um, on-site sanitation and specifically safely manage on-site sanitation and what can we do to be strengthening data systems and much more um, accountability mechanisms towards that. So please, if you're going to be at the Congress, do join us for this session. And with that, I want to say thank you very much. Um, remember to join the network of water professionals. There is a discount that is applicable you can go on the website that is displayed on the screens to find out more. Thank you.